Welcome to the Control Theory Lecture for the Capstone Course. My name is Jonathan Camargo. I'm a PhD student in the robotics program. I'm working at the Exoskeletons and Prosthetic Intelligent Controls Lab. The goal of a control system is to continuously operate on a dynamical system to guarantee performance of a machine or a process. Control is a rather old concept. The origins of control was in the analysis of the centrifugal fugal governor that device allowed for the compensation of the aperture of a throttle valve to guarantee the speed of a steam engine. Let's watch a short clip about its operation. A centrifugal governor is a device used for controlling the speed at which a machine operates by regulating the admission of working fluid. Invented by James Watt in 1788, the governor became a fundamental component in many of the machines that drove the Industrial Revolution. Most commonly fitted on steam engines, power is supplied to the governor via a belt and flywheel connection with the engine's output shaft, causing the governor to spin as the engine runs. The governor operates the throttle valve, supplying steam to the cylinders. As it spins with greater speed, the centrifugal force acting on the flyballs causes them to move outwards and upwards against gravity, pulling the lever arms with them. As the lever arms flex, they pull down on a vertical shaft, lowering it into the throttle valve and reducing the gap through which the steam is fed. If the governor spins fast enough, the shaft cuts off the steam intake completely. Even if the foundations of control are old, new challenges appear and different techniques are developed that de leverage in technologies as Internet of Things and Artificial Intelligence, which require solid foundations in this subject. So in this lecture, I will cover the important concepts at the introductory level for controls theory, and it is expected some uh, basic background in system dynamics. Using this cool chart, I would like to give you some general sense of all the concepts that are under control theory and the ones that we will be discussing about. So I will start by covering by basics of modeling and simulation. So when we describe our system, how do we describe it? Uh, we usually do it in the nonlinear state space, which means that we try to describe all the complexity of the, of the equations of the system, but we usually deal with understanding or evaluating the system in the linear domain. So we, uh, use some tools of um, calculus that allow us to linearize the system and then understand the operation of the system in the linear space based from the nonlinear domain. Once we have the system in linear, uh, in the linear version, we can create uh, transfer functions which uh, describe the system in the Laplace domain. So it is related to frequency and most uh, tools uh, from linear controls are described in, in that domain. Once you have the formulation of your system, you can then create simulations by solving it numerically and then evaluating how the system performs and what is the response to different inputs. That complements the system analysis. Uh, in which an important part is understanding the stability of the system in terms of how the um, state of it will tend towards some particular state or it will diverge from the, the state of the, of, of the system. We are also covering uh, block diagrams, which uh, provides a very simple and natural way of representing the complexity of a system uh, by showing individual components and how they interact with each other. In terms of control methods, uh, we are going to cover tools from linear controls. So we are going to do um, feedback controls using a full state method, full state feedback. 
We are also doing root locus analysis and root locus uh, method for control synthesis. And at the end, I'll briefly uh, talk about a PID, which is the technique that probably you are already familiar with. From a model, we want to understand the system, which means to be able to identify how the system works and how we can uh, have any effect on it. So for this, we need to first think about what type of variables are present in the system, what type of information does it contain. And then once we identify those variables, we want to think about which ones can we actually measure or we can estimate. Then which ones can, can be controlled, like which uh, and by which actions can we have any effect on those variables. Once we, answer to the, once we answer to those questions, then we can start formulating a model which has a representation of the differential equations that describe how those different variables have interaction between each other. For mechanical systems, identifying the variables from the system requires us to look at what type of motion characteristics um, mechanism has in terms of the joints and the restrictions that it has. So we basically start identifying what are the degrees of freedom of the system. Then we want to also think about how do we want to represent the components of the system in terms of a discrete set or if we want to evaluate the continuum of the um, um, solid bodies or the formable bodies that uh, that encompass our system and then we have to identify a good or a convenient system of coordinates that could describe the response and the state of the system with the information that we want to capture so in this example we can see that we identify some degrees of freedom of those joints and then we can label the angles for each one of those degrees of freedom as the important information that we want to use for describing the robotic arm. We can also define some global and local coordinate systems that are um, a mathematical representation of position and orientation in 3D space. Now I want to make a pause here for you to think about that grasping robot. I would like you to answer yourself, how would you model it? For this, I listed different uh, considerations that you could decide if you want to include or not. And uh, on each one of those uh, three categories, like motion characteristics, discretization, and, and the coordinates of the system. So I would like you to think about why would you include or in what situations would you would include uh, different um, aspects of, of the model. For example, if I am only concerned about how the system moves and I and all the parts of the system are mostly rigid, I wouldn't think of any flexibility in the components. I can ignore that part. Or if I know that my motors uh, will not uh, have a lot of power consumption and that temperature will not be a problem, I probably wouldn't need to model the heat transfer of, of the motors or perhaps if the phalanges are rigid and there is no like soft pads for the fingertips I wouldn't my, I wouldn't incorporate that in the model as well. 
Once you answered all your questions about the model and you will start writing the equations that describe it, then you need to have a very structured way of how, repre how to represent uh, that, that set of equations. So the most convenient um, way and more detailed way of doing it is through a state space uh, equation or state space representation of the system which is uh, writing down the set of equations in a way that we identify the derivative of the variable with respect to time as a function of the different variables and their interactions. So that's basically right, organizing the differential equations in a convenient uh, way. This first system is linear and it is easily described then as a matrix multiplication and sum and the second system is non-linear which involves uh, operations that are not linear for constructing its equations here you can also identify what is the state and what are the what is the input of the system An alternative to state space representation is also block diagrams, which are very helpful for encapsulating the complexity of the system that it is uh, evident from the equations in state space. We can hide it by just uh, simplifying the notation and just having more general representation of each one of the components of the system, which could be internally described by a set of a state space uh, representation or equations. To put this in practice, let's create a model for this system. So this is the inverted pendulum in a card, which is a very popular problem for uh, controls as it covers many uh, important, interesting aspects of of control theory. So let's think about this uh, pendulum on a on card system. So first we want to identify the degrees of freedom. There is this joint here that pivots the um, pendulum from the card and the card can also slide only in one single direction which now we identify the coordinates as theta so our system has two degrees of freedom. Now in terms of discretization, we can divide the system in two main components. One is the mass of the card and the other one, the mass of the pendulum. And to describe the coordinates of the system, let's use x for the position of the card and theta for the angle of the pendulum. Now that we identify the key components of the system and the coordinates, then we can start formulating the system of equations. We can do that by two different methods that are very useful for this. The first one is the Newton-Euler method. So for Newton-Euler method, this is the classical way you probably have done um, the modeling of systems like this where you identify each individual rigid body. So 
let's first draw the block diagram of the card so we have the card we have the input force so we have the card we have the x force on acting on the card and the reaction forces at the joint of the pendulum then we have the pendulum mass m let's add the m for the card and we have the the pendulum with the reaction forces at the joint of the pendulum which are opposed to the reaction forces that we wrote in the in the card the diagram we have the gravity term of of the weight of the mass of the pendulum and that will basically describe our system in terms of, of forces. Now that we have the rigid body diagram, then we can use Newton laws and basically solve for the dynamics of the system. An alternative is the Euler-Lagrange method, where you can identify the kinetic energy for each one of the components of the system. So let's say that for the pendulum, we have the kinetic energy and we have identified the velocity of the pendulum as V1 and for the card is V2. And we identify the potential energy for the system, which uh, in the case of this, we have only uh, potential energy for the pendulum as the card is always at the same height. So we describe the energy as a function of the state variables, which in Euler-Lagrange are also known as generalized coordinates. And we define a scalar number called the Lagrangian, which is the difference between the kinetic energy and the potential energy. And then we can use the Euler-Lagrange equation to develop the differential equations that describe the response of the system. So if you do the Euler-Lagrange method or the Newton-Euler method, you, will, you would arrive to the same result. Remember that Q here stands for the generalized coordinates with, in this case, uh, our uh, x and theta. So the Euler-Lagrange equation will be the derivative of L with respect to Q minus the derivative with respect to time of the derivative with respect to Q dot. As the dimensions of Q is uh, 2, then it means that we can obtain one equation per each degree of freedom of the system and then we will have two differential equations. The Euler-Lagrange equation is written as equal to zero, like here, when there is no external forces, or it could be written equals the generalized forces vector, when there is external forces to the system.
in general for a rigid body mechanism you should get the equations of the form uh, m of q times q double dot plus c of q and q dot times q dot plus g of q so the first term represents the inertial interaction of the acceleration and the mass terms the second term represents the coriolis accelerations and the last term represents the gravitational forces and tau represents the applied torque to each one of the joints or the force applied at uh, prismatic joints for the pendulum in a cart we can get to the following equation where F is the force applied to the cart, tau is the torque at the pendulum, x is the horizontal position of the cart, and theta the angle of the pendulum. You can see there uh, that it is easy to identify the terms related to m, for example, and same for the terms related to c and g. Now these two equations describe our system. However, we can simplify the model by assuming that we can have perfect control of the position of the cart, which means that we could define what the acceleration of the cart is at every time. Let's define u as our input of the um, acceleration, and then we can just use the second equation to describe the angle of the pendulum. Let's also assume that there is no input torque into the pendulum joint. However, there could be some friction term, which we can define here as B times theta dot. Now that we know how to model a system, we need to be able to create linear approximations to the system operation. This is important as many of the tools for controls are in the linear space. If we know that our system will be operating in the vicinity of a point in the state space, we can create a Taylor series expansion around that point. That will construct a linear system that approximates to the original system for a neighborhood of the point. The first order Taylor series expansion will define that our function of y and u will be approximated by the function of y bar and u bar, which define the point of operation of the system, plus the partial derivative evaluated at that point times the difference of y minus the point of operation. And same, uh, similar for the terms of u. One important thing to consider is how bad is the error of the linear approximation once you go farther and farther away from the point of operation. Let's practice this with our inverted pendulum model. Taking the equations that we arrived to on the previous slide, Let's first solve for a theta double dot as a function of theta and theta dot and the input u. So we obtain this equation 
And now we can rearrange that equation into a state space representation by defining the states of the system x1 and x2 as theta and theta dot. This transforms the system to a set of ordinary differential equations that are more easy to manipulate. Let's compute the linearization of the system around the point of operation defined by x0, u0. So now we have x dot, an approximation of f at the point of operation, plus the partial derivatives times the difference of position, the difference of the state and the point of operation. In our case, we want to linearize around the equilibrium position of the pendulum aligned vertically, which will be the x equals zero. And as it is an equilibrium point, then the velocity is also zero. And also define that equilibrium when u is equal zero. As an example, let's take the first term of x two dot which is this fraction and let's simplify that a little bit then we get g sine x1 divided by l and that will be our function of x and u. Note that there is no u term, that way when we compute the partial derivative with respect to u, we will get zero. Now we are going to approximate that around the equilibrium point x zero, u zero. So let's compute x zero, u zero, f Let's compute f at x0, u0. Now let's compute the partial derivative with respect to x. So we get g cosine x1. divided by L and we evaluate that at the origin x1 equals 0 we get g divided by L times x1 if you repeat the same process with all the terms, then you get this linear system 
and then here you can identify the term g divided by l that we obtained with the linearization. Now you know how to describe basic systems and create nonlinear expressions that represent the model. And also how to use linearization to arrive to a linear representation of the model around a point of operation. The linear version of the system has the form x dot equals ax plus b u. Where x is the vector of our states of the system. And then A is a matrix size N by N. This matrix is important as it will tell us a lot about the response of the system. As X in time will have responses in the form of E to the power of AT, if we create a diagonalization of the matrix A, we can get the form, the inverse of T times E lambda T times T, where lambda corresponds to the eigenvalues of our matrix A. As the eigenvalues are just the scalar numbers, you can easily note that if lambda is less than zero, the exponential will tend to be zero at infinite time, which means that our system is a stable. This is a very important tool for detecting the stability of the system. But note that this is the stability of the linear system after we linearize the original one. However, if all the eigenvalues of the linearized system are in negative, it also tells us that the nonlinear system in the vicinity of the point of operation is also stable. With this, we end the first lecture where we took a look at how to model the systems, how to create the nonlinear system representation, how to create a linear approximation of that one. And in the following lecture, we will cover some basic concepts to synthesize controllers for our systems.